First of all, um, I want to thank my co-hosts, Eleanor Turner and Dale Treadwell. Um, Eleanor is the uh, biosphere coordinator oh, down there in Kerry Biosphere. And Dale, Dale uh, is um, a former TV presenter, all-round good guy, naturalist. Um, he's a... He's a He's got his own book series. I mean, he, he, he's, a, he's a fantastic guy. He's going to be doing the main part of the presentation. I want to thank the NPWS, National Parks and Wildlife Service, for, a, for providing the license for this uh, webinar. I mean, we're able to have up to, four, up to 500 people in here, and we're getting close to it already. Um, so a big thank you to them for securing that license. Um, so how did this, tr this series come about? Well, we were holding a, a, a grown-ups uh, tri-biosphere series uh, in recognition of the 50th anniversary of the UNESCO Man in Biosphere program. And um, after that uh, first series, uh, after the first webinar, which was on birds of the biosphere in Dublin Bay, we had a, a young person contact us and say they were really interested. It was fantastic. And could we have more aimed at young people? So sure, why not? We looked into it. And um, here we are. We've got a uh, getting close to 400 attendees, many classrooms, many children in the, in the country lucking in. Um, and that's all because of one young person asked the question, um, you know, could it, is it possible? Um, and that's a really important message. Um, it absolutely is. Um, and, you know, we want to hear from you, want to know what you want to learn about uh, with regards to wildlife, because our aim is, is to protect that wildlife. So I'm not going to speak anymore. I'm going to pass over to Eleanor. And Eleanor is going to tell you a little bit about biospheres and why they're so important. Great stuff. Sorry, now I'm just going to share my screen and close down the poll results. So hopefully you can see my screen here. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit of an intro on what biosphere reserves are. So biosphere reserves are UNESCO designated areas and they always include an element of nature conservation. But outside of the nature conservation, people are really important as well. So it's about how we live in the area, how our businesses operate in the area and how we might use that area for recreation and well-being. And how Eleanor, we can do all Eleanor, of just before we keep going, we might have to close the, the poll. OK, sorry. Over now, the screen. Stop sharing and see is the poll closed. Stop share results. Thanks, Dale. I, is it gone now from your screen? It's gone now. And Dara, Fantastic. I think there was a question there before. Approximately one hour there, Dara, who questioned how long it should go for. Great stuff. OK, so we're back. So we're talking about biosphere reserves and there are places where nature and culture connect. So it's about the interaction between people and the place. So I've said the word UNESCO a few times and UNESCO is actually um, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, which is quite a mouthful, which is why we shorten it to UNESCO when we're saying it in conversation, just so everyone's aware what that means. So biosphere reserves are made up of three different areas. The core area, which is the green one in the center, that's always centered around nature conservation and protecting habitats and species. The bluer area, the darker blue area, is the buffer zone. And that's where people start to have activities that promote sustainability or sustainable development or using the environment in a positive way. Then in the transition area, that's where you tend to see a lot of towns. Like in Dublin, you have all Dublin city. <laughs> and then down in Kerry here, we have Killarney Town and Beaufort and lots of little villages around. And that's where people are working towards sustain sustainably using their environment and engaging with the nature around them. So globally, there are 714 biosphere reserves in 129 different countries. And there's over six and a half million kilometers squared within those biosphere reserves and over 257 million people living in biosphere reserves all around the world. But in Ireland, we only have two. So we've got the Dublin Bay Biosphere Reserve over on the East Coast. And down in the Southwest, we have the Kerry Biosphere Reserve. So where exactly is the Dublin Bay Biosphere? Well, it's loosely put, it's around this area here. It takes in parts of Dublin City and the Bay and the coastline. So here's a closer or a better map with nice pictures on it showing you everything from the Dublin port through to the lighthouses and how the area is used by people, which of course is very important with biosphere reserves. 
And down in Kerry, our biosphere reserve is approximately here in the centre. It takes in the McGillicuddy Reeks, the Clarny Lakes and areas around. And here's a closer up map there where you can see our highest mountain, Karen Tool, is right in the centre of the Kerry Biosphere Reserve. So thanks for listening to a little introduction. And now we're going to bring Dale on to start the main event, which is all about birds and bats. So if, while the webinar is going on, you can chat to us in the chat function. If you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A box. Remember that your camera and your microphone is automatically turned off so we can't see or hear you. And I hope you enjoy listening to Dale. So I'll stop sharing my screen, Dale, and you can take over. Boys and girls, teachers, mums and dads who might be homeschooling, how are you? My name is Dale. And I sound a bit funny, don't I? Eleanor sounds like she should be down in Kerry at the Kerry Biosphere Project. And Dean sounds as though he should be at the Dublin Biosphere Project because they're both the coordinators of those projects. I saw a question up there before. I've never seen so many questions on a chat in one minute. So poor Dean's head's going to be going all over and over. But what we're going to do towards the end, if there's any questions, Dean and Eleanor are going to try to list them. And at the end, I'll try to do my best at answering what I can. But boys and girls, I'm going to see you, hopefully see all of you, every Friday for all of March. And what we're going to be doing, we're going to be looking at things which we could find here in our own backyard in Ireland. But of course, I mentioned before, with a funny voice like mine, when I was your size, I'm very big. It's hard to see with my Zoom room. There were some strange animals like kangaroos and koalas. Would anybody like to guess where that was? We'll see some answers come in very, very soon, I think. We'll see, see how close they are. There you I go. Gonna, We've got I lots think of we're going to lose today in the T20, but there you go. But nobody knows about that but Dean and myself. But boys and girls, today we're going to do bats and birds. Next week, we're going to do hedgehogs and other animals. The following week, we're going to do pollinators, which is bees and butterflies and things like that. And our final week, we're going to do bugs, go on a bug hunt. And we're going to do a bit of a um, uh, tree ID course and have a special, special treat for you in the very final week as well, which I'm not going to tell you. So I tell you, you'll know all about it. Now, boys and girls, this is interesting for me because normally I come into your schools or at this time of the day, I'd already have you outside playing games in your own schoolyards. I am a bit confined to my Zoom room, which is a bit of a small space, but I'll do as much as I can. And I'm going to share some screens of some pictures photographs, some videos that I've made, some videos that were made by RTE, and all sorts of different things on birds and bats. But as we said, when it comes to questions and stuff, send them through. Dean and Eleanor will go through a lot of them, and at the end, I'll try to answer a few of them at the end if I can. But boys and girls, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to kick this all off. I know we've got a very mixed audience of juniors all the way through to sixth class who are still homeschooling like my boy is at the moment. So I'm going to do my best to mix it up, have some stuff for the juniors, have some more information for the seniors and make it exciting as I can. But boys and girls, we're going to start by reading you this book. I am guessing this book is up on the big screen. Eleanor and Dean can give me a thumbs up and tell me they can see it. Fantastic. It's called Robbie the Christmas Robin. And to do Robbie the Christmas Robin, you've got to help me because it's got a chant which I'm going to teach you. Now, I wrote this book a number of years ago for my dad on his 70th birthday. And he, like lots of other people's nana and granddads at the moment, has spent the last number of months cocooning. But he's out of his cocoon at the moment. He's back in his men's shed in Australia. So he's, oh, I gave it away. Haven't seen any answers yet. <gasps> so that's a good thing. And very soon we'll all be able to see all of our nanas and granddads, and that's important too. Now, it's got a great forward from a good friend of mine, Mr. Eric Dempsey, and he's a great guy to have in schools as well because he does lots of stuff on Irish birds. He's a great photographer as well. Now, we ready to go with the story. And remember, when we get to the chant bit, I want to, even though I can't hear you, I want to hear you all chanting along with me. It's getting cold in the garden on the eve of Christmas. The first snows of winter are nearly upon us, but Robbie the Robin isn't in a Christmas mood. He feels he has to protect his patch to ensure that he has enough food to eat during this lean time. 
Simon, that Song Thrush is a bigger customer than Robbie, but Robbie is very brave and makes lots of noise to scare and Simon off his patch. Boys and girls, will you repeat after me? Chirpy Chitter Chat. I'm Robbie Robin. Oh, I'm Robbie Scar Robin. Puff out my scarlet breast. I'm, I'm going, going to stand, stand my ground. ground. There was really no need for all that fuss. As Simon, he can break the shells of snails for his dinner. Robbie can't do that. So Simon is no threat to Robbie's fare. Bertie the Blackbird, another big guy in the garden, comes into Robbie's turf. Robbie jumps up and down to frighten Bertie off. Chirpy Chitter Chad. I'm Robbie Robin. Toughest, Toughest guy around. around. Puff out my scarlet breast. I'm going to stand, stand my ground. Hello, can you turn the chat off, please? Sorry. There was really no need as the garden is full of berries from rowan trees, white beam and holly bushes. Many of the trees we'll talk about in our final week of Zoom calls. Bertie has lots to eat and won't eat any of Robbie's breakfast. Gordon the goldfinch visits the garden and Robbie is unimpressed. Chirpy chitter chat! Oh, Hi, Robbie, Robbie Robin! Robin. Toughest, Toughest guy, guy around! around. Puff out my scarlet breast. I'm gonna stand my ground. Robbie needn't be that flustered. Gordon is quite happy eating teasel seeds. Gordon won't be stealing Robbie's brunch. Ben Blue Tit flies into Robbie's garden and Robbie is not amused. Chirpy Chitter Chant! Oh, I'm Robbie, Robbie, Robbie. Toughest, Toughest guy, guy around. around. Puff out my scarlet, scarlet breast. breast. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna stand my ground. Now. Robbie doesn't need to be quite so mean. Ben is happy eating sunflower seeds and won't eat any of Robbie's lunch. Larry the Longtail Tit swoops into Robbie's area and Robbie is raging mad. Chirpy Cheetah Chad! Oh, oh Robbie, Robbie, Robin! Robin. Toughest, Toughest guy, guy around. around! Puff, Puff out my scarlet breast. breast. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna stand, stand my ground. ground. Robbie doesn't need to be quite so nasty. Larry loves to eat peanuts. And he won't take any of Robbie's snacks. Stephen the Sparrow alights in the yard and Robbie scares him off. Chirpy Chitter Chant! Oh, I'm Robbie, Robbie Robin. Robin. Toughest guy around. Puff oh, out my, my scarlet, scarlet breast. breast. I'm, I'm gonna stay in my ground. Stephen Sparrow likes eating scraps of bread from the bird table and won't eat any of Robbie's dinner. Charlie Chaffinch hops into Robbie's patch and Robbie is not pleased. Chirpy Cheetah Chad! I'm, I'm Robbie, Robbie Robin. Robin. Toughest guy around. Puff out my, my scarlet, scarlet breast. breast. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna stand my ground. Robbie can calm down. Charlie is content collecting grass. He's not competing for Robbie's dead cuisine. Jasper the Jay swoops down into Robbie's spot. And Robbie is even more upset. Chirpy Chitter Chant! I'm Robbie Robin. Toughest guy around. Puff out my scarlet breast. I'm, I'm going, going to stand my ground. There's no need for Robbie to be quite so annoyed. Jasper, he dines on acorns, so he won't be a threat to Robbie's supper. Robbie is still hopping mad about all the intruders when he sees Rosie Robin pecking through some leaf litter. Still angry, he keeps jumping up and down and making noise. Chirpy Chitter Chat! I'm oh. <laughs> he finally recognises that it is Rosie Robin looking for grubs. Bobby will have to share. Together they will soon have their own chicks to feed in the spring. Perhaps we can all help Robbie and his feathered friends this winter. It is the season of goodwill after all. Now, boys and girls, if this was a physical book like this, to meet international book stands and regulations, it would have to go from 32 pages from front cover to back cover. Did, did you know that? I didn't know that. This book doesn't go that far. What's the number at the bottom say? 19. So it's not quite finished. Now, you know, when you go to the library, you can get a book which is a non-fiction book. That's a storybook, isn't it? That's kind of like the Robbie book. 
or you can get a, a, a non-fiction, a fiction book, which is a story book, and a non-fiction book, which is a book of facts. So when I started writing books, I wanted to include facts as well. You know what somebody in the book industry told me years and years ago? They told me I couldn't do it. I said, it's my book. I'm going to do whatever I want to. So the book is also all about gardening for birds. And one of our favorite birds, of course, is the robin. So it's all about the plants we can plant, making bird feeders, having water, how to make nesting boxes. I'm gonna talk more about nesting boxes in a bit, but a special kind of nesting box, which isn't for birds, but it's for bats. And how to make a bird cake feeder. And I think Alan will send many people instructions on how to do the bird cake feeders later. So in just a minute, I'm gonna show you how to make a bird feeder in my Zoom room. But before then, we're just gonna stop this screen share for a minute. I'm gonna do another screen share with you because I'm gonna bring you to another friend of mine's garden, a gentleman called Mr. Tom Lundby, where you get to see his garden and gardening for birds. So I have to change a couple of my settings. And I'm hoping we can see that on the big screen in front of us, Dean and Eleanor. So birds are looking for three things, food, shelter, and water. And if you can provide those three things in your garden, then the birds will come. And feeding the birds is not only a great way of attracting them into your garden, but also allows you to watch them from the comfort of your own home. Watch the different species and their comings and going. It's important to provide different food types for the different species. Some like peanuts, others the seed mixes with sunflower and niger seed. And also as well, you can use some scraps and some food from the kitchen, like porridge oats. Also apples, really good food source. And species like blackbird, black cap, love apples some important tips to remember when you're feeding the birds. Firstly, you can place the feeders close to where you can see them, so the back window or the front window, and that means you can keep an eye on the different species coming and going, but also you'll be able to tell when the feeders run empty and you need to go and fill them up. And as well, it's really important to keep a consistent food source, so to feed the, feed the birds regularly. And that's because once they start to rely on, foods, on this food source, it's important to keep it up. As well, Good to position the feeders and the food close to where there's some cover, trees and hedgerows, so that the birds have some cover close by that they can come and go from the feeders. And as well to make sure that you keep the feeders away from cats and from other potential predators. And really important as well, it's good to move around the feeders from time to time so that they're not in the same position for a long period of time, which means that droppings can build up on the ground underneath the feeders and obviously some food will be knocked down and birds will be feeding on the ground and if they're coming into contact with the droppings that can spread disease between birds. So as well as feeding the birds in your garden like this you can also provide them with a natural food source and that's by having native berry producing species in your garden the likes of holly, hawthorn, rowan and ivy and they produce berries in autumn and winter when a food source for birds is vital. So if you have suitable trees, hedgerows and shrubs in your garden, that's already going to provide shelter and suitable nesting sites for a range of birds. But you can also give them a, a little bit of an extra helping hand by providing nest boxes and suitable sites. And these are examples of some of the ne nest boxes that you can put up. And it's important to be familiar with the type of nest box and the, and the species that it's targeted for and know where best to site them. And also to be very careful to keep them away from disturbance and from potential predators like cats. So this nest box is for one of our commonest nesting garden birds and that's the robin and other open nesting species will use this. This is for house martin and they'll build their mud nest on this platform on this base. And then many of our species are cavity or hole nesting and this is replicating that and this is a perfect nest box for blue tit. And, and this small apartment block multi-layered is for house sparrow and they actually nest communally. So the three of these can be occupied at the same time for house sparrow. 
So when it comes to gardening for biodiversity, one of the most important things to remember is to work with nature and not against it, and just let nature do its thing and it will ha happily do so. And that may need a little bit of changing of mindsets and a move away from gardens that are prim and proper and tidy and manicured to more wild and wonderful. And we should judge a garden less so by how tidy it is and more so by the diversity of wildlife it supports. So boys and girls, we're going to be, if you're in classroom, you can make your own along with me or teachers can do it after, after uh, our break time, whatever we wish to do. Now, to, to make out bird feeders, I often melt something called suet or lard or margarine and I melt it with our lot of seeds. Now, I don't know if you can see this. I'm going to keep it away from my computer. Otherwise, I'll make a mess of it. And I melt it in the microwave or some hot water around the outside so i get it nice and nice and gooey which is really fun to play with you get it all over your hands and stuff and i mix it with a mixture of seeds and peanuts and breadcrumbs and all sorts of different things which we might have and then to put it out for the birds we get something like a yogurt pot and we have to put a hole in the yogurt pot you might get somebody who's a bit bigger to stick the hole in for you sometimes you've got to open the hole up with a pen just to make it that little bit bigger because it makes it hard to get the string inside afterwards. So we then have to try to get some string down. I find it easiest just to squash it through. And tie, that's it, We've got it now. And tie a little hole or tie a little knot at the bottom so that then we could hang it upside down like so on the trees and then we've got to fill it up with all the yummy suet and lard and squash it down that's the important thing and then stick it back in the fridge for it to go hard and if it, we have, to, if there are troubles, if it's a warm day and it starts falling apart, you can put a little bit of mesh over the top of it, maybe a, a, what was around an onion bag or something to suit. So that's how we make a bird feeder with lard and suet and just some seeds. Now, a couple of years ago, on a show called Kazoo, I made another bird feeder using a plastic recycled bottle. Today, Kazoo reporter Eilish McSherry is out and about with Dale, making this winter a more comfortable one for some of the creatures around us. And we stick with the green theme for the Art Factory, where our team today are making eco-friendly houses of the future all to come, so stay tuned. But first up, it is getting cold and dark and rainy and windy, and it's all very well for us, because we can go inside and snuggle up under a warm blanket or sit by the fire but for some creatures, they actually have to brave the cold. Poor thing. So today, Dale is out and about showing us how we can make this winter a better one for some of the creatures around us. Kazoo reporter Eilish McSherry is on the case. Have a look at this. Hi, I'm here today to find out some facts about how we can help the animals in our garden during the winter months. I think I'm very aware of the environment, but I want to find out a bit more about the animals. How can we help the animals in winter? What are the things they need? All right, in winter, the animals are just the same as themselves. What they require is shelter to keep them nice and warm and snuggled out of the winter cold, food, because of course they're hungry, and also water for something to drink. That's very important, and sometimes we forget about the water. Now, the first thing which I've wanted to do is I've made up some nesting boxes like this one. This is just a little timber nesting box, and it works quite well. In fact, if you have a look inside, Last spring, oh, wow. we actually had some birds nesting. So we're going to be placing this box up again to see if we get some birds nesting in it this time. This one is not for birds, 
This one is for insects, like ladybirds and bumblebees. And there's all these little hollows here, which different insects can hibernate in. We also want to feed the birds at this time of the year. Now, I collect all of my sunflowers, and here's one here. So what you might help me do there, actually, we're going to brush off all the sunflower seeds, and we're going to brush them into that little container there. So we'll try to brush them around. Now, Ailish, we can buy bird feeders, but I like to make stuff as well. What I want to do with my set of secateurs, I'm going to chop a little triangle hole there, just like that. I'll stick my finger in a little bit and I'll open it up. I don't want it to be too open, because I want the birds to be able to get in there and I don't want water to fall in. So if Ailish, you can fill there for me in the funnel and I'll tip them back down. But Dale, why do we have to feed them? Surely they can feed themselves. Well, in the middle of the winter there mightn't be as much seed around and on a cold frosty morning to set, set out some feeders and like will attract loads of birds into the garden and it'll mean that they've got a little bit to eat to kick start their day to help them along to start looking for more food. I have a little pond here in my yard for the birds to come down and have a drink but on a very fr over, that the birds want to go and get a drink so what I do is I put a ball or two in my pond and it'll bounce around and it'll stop it from frosting over. Here you go. Thank you there, Ailish. We'll hang her up nice and high and that way she's out of the road of predators, but it also means that the birds have got a good vista around so that they can feel nice and safe and hop from branch to branch when they go to feed. But what? So boys and girls, we can make bird feeders like that out of a plastic bottle. Now we were looking at various things like nesting boxes. So following on from nesting boxes, we're going to look at bird nesting boxes, this, which were filmed this year in my garden. And we're also gonna look at a very special nesting box, which is for bats. And right in a halfway mark, we're gonna talk about bats. Boys and girls, linking back to the Robbie the Christmas Robin story, in my garden, I have loads of different bird boxes like this one. And it's generally best to site bird boxes either to the north or the east. But in the, my case, I've got lots of mature trees, so it doesn't matter quite so much because there's a lot of cover. This bird box is for blue tits and alike. I've had another other couple of blue bird boxes. In fact, one of the other ones, last year we had some chicks and we'll show you that picture just now. So boys and girls, that was a bird box. This is something very different. This hasn't got a hole in it. It's actually for bats. And it's got lots of little cuts along the timber line so the bats can climb up into here. In Ireland, we have about 10 different species of bats and we can tell the difference of them by listening to their different calls. Now, with the bat detector, I made some recordings of some pepper straw bats in my garden. Have a listen. Every time you see or hear a bat, call out, bat. Now, a couple of years ago, one of my neighbor's cats actually injured a little pipistrel bat, which myself and my son hand fed till it recovered. Recovering well, he likes the jelly of dog food, doesn't he? Yeah. So what are we going to call him, Nathan? Pip. 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 Very original. Pip the pipistrel bat. Now I'm going to have to cite, cite the bat box up high in the treehouse and I'm eventually going to have to put a few bat boxes around. So join me while I show you how to make a bat box. Boys and girls, we're back again. 
This is our bat box. Now, our bat boxes don't have to be up over the winter months because over the winter months, bats will generally tend to be uh, roosting in our homes and houses and also old buildings like old churches and things like that. And I'm going to show you some footage of bats roosting in an old church very, very soon. But our bat box is very different than our bird box. We notice that there's no hole here at the front because it doesn't need one. It's down here at the bottom. And I've cut all these little slats. They actually go all the way up my bat box. You see that? And these slats are where the bats can, with their little paws, they can climb their way up to get themselves sheltered away. So bats tend to use bat boxes like this over the summer months where they're up on tree and they use them as roosting sites and nursery for baby bats. So I'll have to stick this one back up on the tree later. Now, there are various different designs of bat boxes. That one's the design I like to use, but another design is a bat box called a tent bat box. So I'm gonna show you my tent bat box. Here it is here. I have to change a couple of my settings to make it look better. There we go. And some boys, mums and dads, or girls, mums and dads, and boys, anybody can make, might be able and keen to make a bat box like this. This isn't that difficult either. There's just lots of straight bits of timber which, which are cut in shapes rather than having to cut too many angles on your timber. There we go. Brilliant stuff. Now, speaking of bats and bats living in homes of life, I'm going to read you another story. This isn't a story of mine. This is a story by another lady who wrote a book called Bat loves the night by Nicola Davies. Bat is waking upside down as usual, hanging by her toenails. Her beady eyes open, her pixie ears twitch. She shakes her thistle down fur. She unfurls her wings made of skin so fine the finger bones inside show through. Now she unhooks her toes and drops into black space. With a sound like a tiny umbrella opening, she flaps her wing. Bat is flying. Out. Out under the broken tile into the nighttime garden. Over bushes, under trees, between fence posts, through the tangled hedge, she swoops untouched. Bat is at home in the darkness with the fishes in the water. She doesn't need to see. She can hear where she is going. Bat shouts as she flies, louder than a hammer blow, higher than a squeak. She beams her voice around her like a flashlight, and the echoes come singing back. They carry a sound picture of everything her voice has touched. Listening hard, Bat can hear every detail the smallest twigs, the shape of leaves. Gliding and fluttering back and forth, she shouts her torch of sound among the trees, listening for her supper. All is still. That fat moth takes flight below her. Bat plunges fast as blinking and grabs it in her mouth. But the moth's pearly scales and moon dust slippery. It slithers from between her teeth. Bat dies nets it with a wingtip, scoops it into her mouth. This time, she bites hard. Its wings fall away, like the wrapper from a candy. In a moment, the moth is eaten. Bat sneezes, the dusty scales now up on her nose. A bat can eat dozens of big moths in a single night, or thousands of flies, gnats, and mosquitoes. Most species of bat eat insects, but there are some that eat Fruit, fish, frogs, give it blood. Hunting time has run out. The dark will soon be gone. In the east, the sky is getting light. It's past bat's bedtime. She flies to the roof in her last shadow and swoops in under a broken tile. Inside, there are squeakings. Fifty hungry battlings hang in a huddle, hooked to a rafter by oversized feet. Bat lands and pushes in among them, toes first, 
upside down again. That knows the baby's voice and calls to it. The velvet scrap battery climbs aboard and clings to the bat's fur by its coat hanger. Wrapped in a leather wing, the baby suckles the bat's milk. Outside, the birds are singing. The flowers turn their faces to the sun. But inside the roof hole, the darkness stays. That dozes with a battling waiting. When the tide of night rises again, Bat will wake and plunge into the blackness, shouting, Bat loves night. Boys and girls, we're going to show you another video now of bats in a roosting site, which was filmed on a show which was called Living the Wildlife. Bats have always had a bad press and I really don't know why. They don't like graveyards any more than we do and they're certainly not flying mice. In fact, they're much more closely related to us humans than they are to any kind of rodent. As far as we know, there are 10 species found in Ireland and over the next couple of days, I'm hoping to... Just it's a light as a feather, isn't it? Very light, yeah, you wouldn't even know there was one in there. I'll just have a little look at them and then let them go. Yeah. Is this a non-biting individual now, this one? Uh, they don't bite anyway, they've no front teeth. Ah, uh, yes. He only weighs six or seven grams, but he can live for 20 years. And he's got to eat half his body weight in insects every night. For his size, he's got the longest ears of any animal. They're about the same length as his body. His hearing is so acute that he doesn't need echolocation at all. He can actually hear the footsteps of an insect crawling across a leaf. His ears are folded back out of the way until he needs them, and then he pumps them up with blood in an instant. They're a bit bemused at what's happening to them because exactly. they don't expect giant humans to come along and pick them up, like you know. So it's a bit, but he'll have a tale to tell his friends when he goes home <laughs> to see. I'm not often called a giant now either, to be honest. No. <laughs> He'll be fine. No. Oh, look! Oh, is they beautiful? He's home anyway, but um, he'll go back into his friends once we get out of the way, you know? Yeah, yeah. We'll yeah. Oh, well, maybe that's what we should do. Yeah. If we can manage to get down out of this attic thing again without breaking their necks. Mm -hmm. Now, boys and girls, if I was with you, it'd be time to have a stretch. Unfortunately, we're just going to have to keep going for a minute and you can have your stretch at break time. But if we had our stretch, I'd take you outside, I'd get you in a big, big circle, you know, ring a ring a rosy style circle, and I'd get you to put on a blindfold. And I'd get somebody to call out, BAT! And somebody else is going to call out, MOTH! Bat! Moth! Bat! Moth! Moth! Oh, gotcha! <laughs> there you go. So that's a game you guys could play. It's called Bat Moth. And you could do it with multiple bats and multiple moths. And then it gets really fun. Boys and girls, we've been so, so good. We've had such a good time learning about birds and birds. Hang on. Wrong direction. Bat. We're going to finish off with something a little bit fun. It's called the Bat, Bat, Bat song. And I can hear you to make sure that you're singing along. And after the Bat, Bat, Bat song, 
sure. <gasps> oh, look, there's about 52 Q&As out there. That'll keep me going in 99 plus chats. We might get all 52 Q&As, but I might be able to get a few of them. And if I don't know the answer, because I don't know everything, I've always said that. If I don't know the answer, I'll find out the answer before next week. That's important. So last one, I want you all singing along to bats, bats, bats. Early in the evening as the sun goes down, all the stars begin to light up the sky. Well, there's one little creature that's just waking up Till the first crack of dawn she will fly So many stories I've told about her She's the queen of Halloween <laughs> But half the stories I've told by people She had never seen no. Bats, 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 funky little bats Bats are the critters of the night Fun little butterfly and bulldog bats Some folks, they get to screaming if they see a bat go by. Get a bat can hear you as she's flying up there in the sky. She's calling out and hearing back, and she can even sing. Ain't no way she is looking to bump into you or me. So many stories I've told about her. She's the queen of Halloween. <laughs> Half the stories I've told by people she has never seen. Oh, fast, 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 funky little bass. That's all the critters of the night Fun little butterfly and bulldog bats Bats know where everything's at They don't go bump, you know Well, the big bats, little bats, the bats are hard to see The bats are living curds, the rocks they're in the eaves The bats that eat mosquitoes and every bug in sight There's even bats that feed on fruit as they dance through the night so many stories I've told about her She's the queen of Halloween <laughs> But half the stories I've told by people She has never seen no. Bats, 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 funky little bats Bats are the critters of the night Funnily butterflies So I hope you were all singing along. Boys and girls, I okay. saw a picture there, which reminds me of a story. I forgot to tell you the story. The picture was of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And there were lots of bats flying over the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Now, they weren't the little micro bats we find here in Ireland. They were fruit bats. They were grey-headed fruit bats. One of 14,000 or 1,400, sorry, different species of bat in the world. That makes them one of the most diverse mammals anywhere in the world and of course they're the only mammals which can fly but these bats the gray headed flying fruit bats are the largest of all the bats and they have a wingspan oh yeah it's a bit hard to show you on my zoom ring because it's not even quite that but almost a, a three quarters of a meter in length and they're not that heavy but they're like a phantom chicken in size now i know there's lots of classes listening from all over the country. I saw Drum Conrath in County Mead. I saw some schools down in Waterford that I've been to and visited before. I know there's a school in Kildorky which might have some students listening in today. And in Kildorky, one of your teachers is Mrs. Treadwell. Now, Mrs. Treadwell, she went to a holiday to Australia about 25 years ago. And when she was on this holiday, she met this very strange gentleman who used to do things like rescue fruit bats. 
because he used to live with his cousin, he used to couch surf. I don't know what anybody knows what couch surfing means, but it means if you've got to live on other people's couches. Now, they had a good couch because they had a bed that you could fold out, so there's lots of room. I don't know who this person was. Anyway, I used to rescue, hang on, I've given away. I used to rescue fruit bats. So I used to climb up and down ladders. And mummy fruit bats, they don't use echolocation. And unfortunately, every now and again, they land in the power lines. So they got zapped. So I'd have to rescue the baby fruit bats. So he explains what happened to my hair. No, no, it's a bad story. That's a bad joke. Anyway, Mrs. Treadwell was going on a holiday and she met this strange gentleman and he invited her back for what, dinner one evening. But before he had dinner, he had to feed all the pets. So he took her out to the aviary and he gave her big trays of fruit to carry with him. She didn't know what was coming. And then all the fruit bats landed on her. And she should have run away then. All the boys and girls in Kildorky will know about that story. And I hope soon I'll get to come and do some more work in your school garden, Kildorky. Hey, Dale, um, I think we're going to have to get to the questions because we've got... Absolutely. Um, we've, my gosh, we'll see, see if we can get through about 10 or so. Not <laughs> we'll quite, yeah, answer not quite quick by. And boys and girls, keep in mind, you know what we'll do? If we have some layover questions, I'll answer them next week. Okay. So Dale, what we're going to do is we're going to, myself and Eleanor will take turns. We'll, uh, we'll read out one of the questions um, and we'll see if we can get you to answer. Is that all right? So we'll, I'll, I'll we'll, we'll, the Because there's so many questions, we can't uh, answer them all. So uh, <laughs> let me have a look. There is a lot. There's a lot that are quite similar though as well. So oh, I think if, yeah. we, if we answer about 10 or so questions, I think that we'll have a lot of the topics. <laughs> so uh, this one is, um, my dog keeps chasing the birds away. <gasps> is there any way I can stop my dog or not well i mean i could answer that but do you want to do you want to answer yes yes um it involves training the dog now i'm not sure what kind of dog you have but i can assume if it's a dog which barks at birds it's probably a terrier i've got one of those um they're very good at hunting mice and rats but they're also a bit mad and they bark at birds now unfortunately this is a whole another day's work if I actually took back to a past lifetime, because when I was your age, I'm sure this person who's calling um, or sending in this message is probably already 11 or 12. When I was 11 or 12, I used to train dogs as a hobby. So there's a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of training the dog not to chase the birds. What it involves is praising the dog when he does the right thing and correcting him when he does the wrong thing. So that's what yeah, taking him out taking your lead out with the dog and every time he sees a bird you, you tell him no and he actually gives him a little jolt and say no very firmly you don't hurt him but you're just making him know that you don't want him barking at the birds yeah and then when he's quiet and he's not barking at the birds you praise him and you give him a treat so you yes. give him the idea that he's to not bark at birds but you're still wanting to bark at sort of um, trespassers on the property or people who might be robbing dad's shed. So, um, um. and Dale, uh, you mentioned leads. I mean, leads is really important. I mean, keeping dogs on lead when they're out yeah. in wild places where they could uh, run after after birds that's really important. Eleanor, do you have a question there? Yeah, so there's actually a lot of questions. I just want to quick scroll through. So there's a lot that kind of cover like what do bats eat? Why do they only come out at night? And how big are the bats in Ireland? Or how okay. many different species Let's are work there? backwards. Keep it short. Bats, <laughs> bats in Ireland are very small. None of them are much bigger than, hang on, wrong way, your thumb, okay? Hey, the, the, in the pepper store, they're even smaller. Okay, so even size, but they're not very big at all. Bats in Ireland are quite small. Um, now, what they eat, in Ireland, all of your bats are insectivorous, so they eat insects, they don't do anything else. Now, in other parts of the world, I know there are bats which eat frogs and fish, and there's the vampire bat, the famous one from South America, but we don't have them here in Ireland, okay? Only insectivorous bats in Ireland. And of course, the bats in Australia talk about what fruit bats, they're very important, they're pollinators. Um, size, what they eat. There was another bit to that question as well, wasn't there? Or why do they only come out at night? Ah, right. They, now, bats have evolved to come out at night to avoid daytime predators, things which might eat them like larger birds. Remember, we said bats are very small. So they've sort of evolved to be out at nighttime. 
and they, now their food source is often moths and midges and the like, which you find flying around at night time as well. So they've sort of evolved to come out at night, avoid daytime predators, and that's why they go in their hollow. So <clears throat> I've got a question here from uh, first and second class Newtown in RD. And RD? How many... Oh, I know. Oh, you know it. Okay, I know good, Newtown good. School. Okay, fantastic. So um, how many different species of native birds are there in Ireland? Ooh, that's a tricky one, I imagine. Now, that is a tricky one because what happens here in Ireland is we have what we call resident birds. And we also have birds which are non-resident birds. Now, the resident birds, by that I mean many of the birds which were in the Robbie, the Robin story, we see in our garden all year round. But we also have lots of non-resident birds. And I know when we do a lot of work, particularly with the Dublin biosphere, we talk a lot about a lot of these birds because there's a lot of birds which now they're just about to pack up and go. They're in places like the sort of Bull Island and uh, all over the estuaries sort of from um, to the north of Malahide and places like that. And all over the country in Ireland, there's other places where these non-resident birds, these migratory birds. Play. Now, many of these birds would be things like French geese and oyster catchers and all sorts of things, where they actually spend our, our summer months, they go back to the Arctic, uh, where it's, there's a, a food source for them there. But they come here because they think our winters are quite mild. Well, it is compared to the Arctic. And then we have birds which are migratory in the summer, like the swallows and the swifts, and the house martins and sand martins, they all come from Africa. So they come a really long way, but they don't like it here in our winter. So they go back over Africa. In fact, they have to fly over the Saharan desert, which is pretty tough because they get blown around in lots of winds and there's not much water and all sorts of things on route. Um, and they actually have to eat insects from one particular lake on their route. And they can't drink the water because the water is poisonous, but they can eat the insects. From that lake and that's how they that's how they can sustain themselves so that mixes and changes and every now and again we actually find there's sometimes there's birds which come in which are normally from europe and we don't often see them in ireland so that figure goes up and down a little bit but you know what i'll get you a broad figure for next week okay uh, it'll be broad because it changes <laughs> <laughs> Eleanor. <laughs> hey, it changes through the year, I suppose. I'm going to go back to the bat questions. Another question has come in about bats and, and it's asked a few times. So because they're quite small, how do they keep warm? And then also, how are bats born? <laughs> okay. Bats keep warm by huddling together. That's what you see in my little bat box here. You could have 20 or 30 bats in this tiny little bat box and they huddle together to keep warm. Bats are mammals. They're like us. So, you know, on a cold night, if the fire's not working and the electricity's gone or whatever, um, you might, with the blankies, rub up to mum and dad because it, it keeps you warm. Bats do the same thing. Now, bats are mammals. So baby bats are born just like baby people are born. Okay? And they're placental mammals. Now, the only difference is bats bear their babies while they're hanging upside down. So that makes life a little bit tough. The baby bat's got to be able to cling on straight away. And often what baby bats do is they cling on straight, straight away and they huddle with their mothers um, for a period of time until they can go into a, 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 a roost which with other little baby bats. And they all stay together and stay huddled together that way to keep them. That's a good question. I'm glad that one kept me going with it with, 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 with an answer too. Fantastic. There's a, another quick question for you as well, Dale. A lot of people are asking where they can get your books from. Ah, now, books are out of print, but you know what you can do? Both books are available at the Heritage in School website. You can get them as a free download PDF from the Heritage in School's website from the teacher learning resources section. Maybe one day in the future, we'll, um, we'll think about doing a reprint, but um, probably not this year. Okay, so what I'll do, everyone that's listening in, since you've registered, I'll have your email address. So I'll find the link to the PDF version of Dale's books, and I'll put it in the email that's going to go out to you tomorrow, okay? So you'll be able to follow through there and get the, the full book from, from the website. 
Yeah, and the the videos that were playing at the beginning, that the quality wasn't great. We can send the details on for them as well. And there's a lot of great videos in that series about how you can garden for wildlife. Dale, yeah, I've got a question here from Antonio. Antonio. Um, uh, Antonio lives in an apartment near Dublin. Um, they want to know if they can make bird feeders that won't get attacked by seagulls. Um, is there a way that they can make them a bit better, or do is are the seagulls likely to be interested? Uh, yes, so, you know, seagulls are interested in anything. Anytime there's food, seagulls are interested. Now, there's a little trick which I know a lot of rural schools which have open areas um, do to try to um, protect bird feeders from the larger birds like jackdaws and, uh, and rooks because um, they're wanting to feed the smaller birds, not the bigger birds. And what they do is they use something which um, you put, put around bird feeders to protect them from squirrels. It's an it's a globe, if you like, uh, with lots of little triangles all around the globe. It's in, it's in the, the shape of two geodomes stuck together. Oh, a little hint. In a couple of weeks' time, if anybody watches news today, there's going to be a geodome in a school in County Meath. Probably they're going to go to and look to because I think it's got something special on kids going back from third to sixth class from the school. A little hint, I only found about this yesterday. We get to see what the dome looks like. But you have the feeder inside the, the, the circle, which is to protect it. So they're sold as, if you like, bird feeders for the squirrel protection. Okay. But they'll prevent the seagulls having as easy a job at it. Unfortunately, seagulls are pretty crafty as well. On our very last session, in, at the end of the month, my special surprise, I'm going to come back to birds in a strange way, um, but I'm going to sort of hint why seagulls are so voracious and lots of different birds are so voracious and at all. Okay. It's a big Cretaceous. Okay. Did I give another hint away? I'm, I'm, I'm good at giving hints, aren't I? You'll give away all your secrets for the there next There we go. Webinars, Guys, yeah. I think we're down for our last couple of minutes. So I've got yeah. one, two more questions. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, I'll keep the film and I can always rehash it. Okay, so Dale, time. we've got a question here from Miss Lundy's fifth class in uh, St. Rose's. And does it hurt the bats when the wings are opened by people looking at them? Yeah, no, but the, the, when you've got people who are uh, like the guys in that video where they're researching and they were being super, super careful and very, very gentle. Um, it's a, 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 a little bit like you might be handling just a, 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 a small, delicate bit of paper. So I've been very, very careful not to do, do any damage. You can't be rough with the bats at all. Now, it's not advisable for people to handle bats unless they're a researcher and had an awful lot of experience. Um, bats have got a lot of bad press in this last year. Uh, there is a reason for that. Unfortunately, it is true. Um, the current coronavirus, which we're all going through, it's possibly passed on from wild bats. Now, it's not the bat's fault. It's people's fault for it happening. But bats have evolved to survive many different uh, viruses and things which people can't survive. Um, and the reason uh, why often there's fevers and things involved with um, uh, different illnesses, bats can survive these different hot temperatures and fevers that because they're used to flying whereas we find it very very difficult so um yeah it doesn't pay to handle bats unless you know what you're doing and even you might have noticed the bat which i was rescuing and handling i was using gloves and uh and also tea towels i wasn't touching the bats by hand myself Fantastic tech. So, right. Well, actually, look, we've, we've come to the end of our time, Dale. Um, I think there's a lot of questions coming through and not all of them are proper questions. <laughs> but what I'm going to say I, is... I've been in school and had some uh, of them before. Uh, it'd be a little bit of that. <laughs> so I think maybe we'll have a think about how we maybe take some of the questions and we may actually ask people who have registered to maybe send in their questions beforehand and we'll disable the chat and the questions and um, you know we'll answer them as we go and uh, do it slightly differently. Um, but Dale, thanks very much. That was really very interesting. Um, it, it's a It's a... 
a new webinar for us and we're certainly learning all the time um, uh, we hope people have enjoyed it and we've certainly another three in this series um, and we're going to be certainly ourselves we're going to be learning um, uh, you know how we can uh, improve on these webinars going forwards but certainly we hope everyone's had a great time I've certainly learned a lot about uh, birds and bats so thank you so much uh,